Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, this video is designed to review the key parts of chapter six uh, from your textbook, which is all about interest groups. Interest groups are a group of people that share a common interest and most importantly, they seek to change or influence government policies. Um, so this is different from just a group of people meeting up and talking about environmental issues. It's the fact that they're meeting and talking about this issue and they want to change how the government will decide on an issue, the government policies, the outcome. So their most important thing is that they want to pass policy. They don't run their can own candidates because if they did, we would call them a political party. They're not a political party. They want to influence elected officials. And there's several access points to which they can um, lobby or talk to um, various levels of government. And this is all at the local, state, and national levels in, in all three branches, executive, legislative, judicial. But this also includes all of the, uh, the bureaucracy, all the aides and the congressional staffers who work for Congress or who work for the president as part of the White House staff or as part of the um, Office of Management and Budget, you know, everything, every single axis of government, interest groups can talk to them. Some examples, now these are just some of the mo um, most talked about or more influential interest groups. A AARP is um, an a interest group for retired Americans, so if you're 50 or older, you can join. Sierra Club is the oldest environmental lobby, NAACP. That was established in the early 20th century um, for African Americans or advancement of colored people. Uh, you also should know the NRA, that's the National Rifle Association, and I would also highlight the AMA. They've appeared on an FRQ in years past, um, so know the American Medical Association as well. Here we have some images, um, some of their seals. Now there's thousands of them, you don't need to memorize them all, but you should know a couple from each category. The big question that we have with talking about interest groups is, are they good or are they bad for American politics? And to think about this, you've got to think back to Unit 1, where we talked about different theories of government, pluralism, elitism, and hyperpluralism. We're going to go through each one and apply interest groups to that theory. Under the pluralist theory, that's the idea that there's many factions or groups within society and they naturally form, right? And the idea is that pluralism is a good thing because the many, all having multiple groups prevents one from being too powerful. And this is defined in Fed 10, written by James Madison, essentially saying that factions are bad, but they're necessary evil because they help prevent one group from becoming too powerful. They also serve, they're also good because interest groups are a linkage institution. They help link the people to the government. It gives voice to people because a crowd is louder than a single person just shouting out or lots of different people shouting out different things and so you can't hear anything. The problem with the pluralism theory is that, yeah, lots of groups are good. However, you have the free rider problem. That's where someone who is part of a group, but they don't pay into it, so they're not officially part of it, and that they get all the benefits. So think about this. Um, every single old person in the United States does not join AARP. However, AARP does represent a very influential lobbyist group, and they lobby for higher social security benefits. So if Congress approves and they pass a law that approves and increases social security benefits to all people age 65 and older, then people who, seniors who are not part of the AARP still get the benefits, yet they didn't have to pay anything um, to get the AARP to, to lobby on their behalf. So they're considered to be a free rider. They're, they're you know, um, a grifter. They just get the free stuff. And that is a problem with pluralist theory, and there's not an easy way to get rid of it. 
The elite theory says that, yes, there's lots of groups, but only the upper crust or the elite have any type of influence. And we apply that to interest groups that mainly holds that there's only a couple of key interest groups that actually matter at all. And that mainly has to do with money. And the, the interest groups that have the most money are business interest groups. Last part is hypopluralism. Hypopluralism says, yes, there are many interest groups or many different groups. However, there's way too many groups and so nothing gets done. It leads to gridlock. In a hyperpluralist theory, it's, it states that the government is trying to please everyone, trying to please all the different interest groups. However, there's too much, there's too many interest groups, and the policies that are developed are really disorganized, they're haphazard, and they're not, they're ill-conceived, they're just bad laws. And so that leads to gridlock, nothing gets done. What makes interest groups very powerful? The size really matters, how many members you have the intensity or the drive or the effort that you put forth. Um, single issue groups tend to be more intense even though they have a, a smaller size and money can make interest groups pretty powerful. Remember all interest groups will typically form a PAC that's a political action committee or even a super PAC. Um, those PACs then donate money to individual campaigns um, like the Marco Rubio campaign, or they'll do independent advertising or non-connected advertising. Um, and the bigger, biggest packs tend to be the corporate packs, the big business packs, but not all, all of them. Types of interest groups. There's really five outlined in your textbook. I just want to go over a couple. Economic. This includes labor unions, but also agricultural um, is another important interest group within the economic type, like the soybean lobby, um, professional economic interest groups, and businesses as well. There's public, in your textbook it says public interest groups, but really you might also hear them being called consumer interest groups. They, t they believe to represent an entire public, the general good. Um, and then you also have equality and justice interest groups. These tend to focus more on race, race and gender issues and religious issues. Most of the equality and justice interest groups, they also tend to be single issue interest groups as well. How do they work? Interest groups mainly spend most of their time doing these two things, lobbying, which is they actively influence government policy and it includes all of these different types of activities. Emailing officials, emailing staff, meeting and socializing with them, taking key aides or congressional staffers to lunch um, so you can have a conversation with them. Uh, testifying at committee hearings is another really important step. Uh, donating money as well, which is number two, electioneering, getting people into office who are sympathetic, so giving money to campaigns that's electioneering, um, but also um, bringing influential constituents to Washington, D.C. to lobby on your behalf. Um, so lobbying is more of a general term, influencing government policies, typically through targeting specific congressional staffers and congressional uh, congressmen and senators that will be susceptible to your message uh, and electioneering, giving money to campaigns. They also can uh, be involved in litigation or suing people. Groups can sue businesses or government for action. So Brown v. Board, uh, paid for by the uh, Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP. That is an, an example of the NAACP, NAACP interest group uh, using litigation. They can also file briefs or reports um, that consist of an argument, they lay out an argument for the side that they believe in. And we call this amicus curiae briefs, uh, which means friend of the court. Um, these are written by people who are not connected to the 
court case directly. They're just an interested party. And we're going to study that a little bit more when we do our judiciary unit. They can also make appeals to the, to the public. And they can also do a ratings game where lots of interest groups will rate politicians based on their voting records and endorse certain candidates. The most famous interest group that does this is the NRA. So here we have uh, the NRA gives voter guides and they rate people. So in the um, 2014 Virginia governor election, they rated the uh, Ken Cuccinelli, the Republican uh, nominee for governor, an A. And Terry McAuliffe, who actually did win, he's a Democrat, uh, an F rating from the NRA. So on these certain issues, the NRA would not believe Terry McAuliffe to support the issue that the NRA cares about. How do interest groups get money? Mainly through donations, but also foundations. Some interest groups are also uh, non-governmental organizations, so they're, they're tax deductible, they're focused on um, giving aid so they can get uh, federal grants. And remember, interest groups have to disclose who they donate to um, they, uh, through their PAC, and that's all done through the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission. The last part is the Iron Triangle. So when we're talking about the relationship between um, Congress, a specific interest group, and a specific department in the bureaucracy, we call it the Iron Triangle. Um, and this is because they have a mutual and beneficial relationship. So an interest group will often um, lobby Congress to pass a certain law and or or they'll lobby a part of the bureaucracy to um, favor their business um, and they'll often give money and support um, so you can see the interest group giving electoral support to congress uh, congress then in turn gives money and political support to a bureaucracy agency and then that bureaucracy agency tends to give special favors or low regulation to um, that interest group to whatever that interest group represents. So if we're talking about Boeing, which makes airplanes, they will often donate money to congressmen who served on the Armed Services Committee or um, uh, the Veterans Affairs Committee or the um, Appropriations Committee for defense funding. And those congressmen will then give or more likely to give more money to programs that would benefit Boeing. So they'll give more money to, to the DOD. And then the DOD will respond and give special favors or um, projects to Boeing in return. So Boeing will have a government contract and they'll get and they'll make, you know, a whole bunch of warplanes for us or something. So that relationship that is both dependent and mutual will is, is what we call the Iron Triangle. All right, that's it. Hope you guys understand interest groups a little bit more.